On the early morning hours of Saturday the 24th of August 1985, the Shorthouse family, a mum and dad and three little boys, all under the age of six, lay sleeping in their beds. Suddenly, there was a loud thunderous banging at the door. An unfortunate sequence of events would then follow which would lead to the shooting death of a five-year-old boy. This is the tragic story of the unaliving of five-year-old John Shorthouse. Five-year-old John Shorthouse Jr., born on the 1st of August 1980, to parents Jacqueline Shorthouse, previously Jacqueline Pretty, and John Shorthouse Sr. He lived at home at 6 Barrett's Road, Kings Norton, postcode B38, with his two younger brothers, two-year-old Dennis Shorthouse and four-year-old Danny Shorthouse. And he attended St Paul's Catholic Primary School. On the early hours of the morning of Tuesday the 24th of August 1985 at approximately 6am the family were in bed asleep when they heard a loud thunderous bang at their front door when it was suddenly kicked off its hinges by a battering ram and they were all rounded up still half asleep. It was four armed policemen, West Midlands police had conducted a dawn raid at their home. Two days earlier, on Thursday the 22nd of August 1985, three men broke into the Old Malt restaurant in Kidwelly, South Wales, owned by a Mr Norman Aubrey with a sawn-off shotgun, stealing only £180 and two cheques. A tip-off to police led them to John Shorthouse Senior, aged 26, and his accomplices, 35-year-old Jonathan Williams, unemployed of Thurf Drive, Yardley Wood, Birmingham, and 28-year-old Stephen James Christopher, unemployed of Cavendish Tower, Walker's Heath, Kings Norton, who handed himself into a police station two days after the raid. Going on this tip-off, they raided their homes just two days later. Once rounded up, Jacqueline said that she told police her other son was in the second bedroom which also had a cot in there, as well as a small child's bed. The police led her husband, John Shorthouse, away in handcuffs. Minutes after Mr Shorthouse had been led away, a gunshot was heard. Police had been searching the house when 36-year-old PC Brian Chester, a Coventry constable of Fletch Hampstead Police Station, Coventry, said that he leaned under the bed in the second room with a torch and due to the tightness of his bulletproof vest, he was having difficulty getting down to get under the bed. With his gun cocked and his finger on the trigger whilst doing this, PC Brian Chester said his gun had accidentally gone off. Initially, he said he thought he'd just shot a bundle of blankets until he heard a noise coming from the blankets and realised to his horror there was a child underneath. He claims he did not even know there was anybody in the room, despite the boy's mother telling police a moment before that her son was in the second bedroom. Another version of events claims that PC Brian Chester saw a pile of blankets on the bed and that he saw the blanket wriggle and he accidentally fired into the blankets as a reflex action. Whichever version of events is correct, the media went with the first explanation and ran with it. John Shorthouse Jr. was shot in the chest, the bullet tearing through his heart. The public was outraged upon hearing about the death of five-year-old John and demanded to know how a trained police marksman, also a member of the Tactical Firearm Squad and with 16 years experience in the force, had accidentally managed to shoot dead an innocent five-year-old child in his own bed. And why was his gun still cocked with his finger on the trigger if the suspect had already been taken out of the home in cuffs, meaning there was no threat 
to the officers in the home at that time. Police then responded to these allegations saying that the suspect had not left the home yet and that's why his gun was still cocked with his finger on the trigger. But the mother, Jacqueline Shorthouse, was adamant that her husband had already been taken off into a police car and driven away when the gun went off. He was not in the house when his own son was shot. West Midlands Police Chief Constable Mr Geoffrey Deer said that PC Brian Chester is anything but the image of the Starsky and Hutch character. He is a family man, mature and brave, with sensible interests, but I would not think that he would want to go anywhere near a firearm again. The officer has been devastated by the tragedy. PC Brian Chester was suspended with full pay until a report by Police Complaints Commission conducted by Chief Constable of Lancashire, Mr Joel Mounsey, was completed, which was expected to take several weeks. PC Chester was also moved under police protection to a secret location with his three small children and pregnant wife. Meanwhile, John Shorthouse said that he was only informed of his son's death 12 hours later after police allowed his wife Jacqueline to come to Kings Heath Police Station where her husband was being held to break the news to him of his son's killing. John Shorthouse said that he knew nothing of the murder at all which made family publicly question why the police were claiming that he was in the house when his son was shot dead if he had no knowledge of it. West Midlands Police refused to comment. After being shot, five-year-old John was rushed into a police car and taken to Selly Oak Hospital. The raid had happened at 6am. By 10 past 6, John had been shot in the chest. By 6.40am, he was pronounced dead by Dr Holborn. Many believed that the boy had died immediately and when rushed into the police car, he was already dead. He was pronounced dead on arrival. Angered by what had happened, violence erupted on the streets when a group of around 30 men wielding sticks and metal bars attacked police on the night John Jr. was killed. A window of a service station a few hundred yards from the Warstock pub in Yardywood Road, which was a regular hangout of the boy's father, John Shorehouse Sr., and members of his family was smashed and then the mob lay in wait for the police to come. When a police officer came to investigate the call to the service station, the angry mob stoned the police car. Backup was called and 12 police officers and six cars arrived. Policewoman 22-year-old Tracy Hughes, stationed at Kings Heath Police Station, was dragged from her police car and attacked and ended up being taken to Birmingham Accident Hospital with severe bruising. Two police cars were damaged in the incident and PC Tracy Hughes' condition was described as being comfortable as can be expected. Five men and a woman was arrested for public order offences, criminal damage and assault on a police officer. A police spokesman appealed for people in the area to maintain their calm. Relatives of the boy demanded a full inquiry with his uncle Michael Lewis stating that the family's mood was very bitter and they wanted to know how the officer's gun had gone off so easily. He also stated that the best way to establish what had happened was with a public inquiry. Jack Pretty, the grandfather of five-year-old John Jr. spoke of his triple loss, stating that he had lost a granddaughter to cot death and another grandson had been taken out of the country by his Cypriot mother and now he had to deal with the murder of his grandson. He said, You're supposed to have more children around you as you grow older, not less. 
I have been looking forward to enjoying their company and now this has happened. John had celebrated his fifth and final birthday just three weeks before his untimely killing. Within three hours of the fatal shooting, an independent inquiry was set up under a senior officer and the Police Complaints Authority was sent a preliminary report. Police Chief Constable Mr Geoffrey Dia offered his deepest regret and sympathy on behalf of the West Midlands Police and Attorney General Sir Michael Havers was put forward as the potential person that would decide on the face of PC Brian Chester who had shot the boy following a 15-week investigation by Director of Public Prosecutions who had been trying to decide if PC Brian Chester should face court action for accidentally killing the boy. Chairman of West Midlands Police Federation, Chief Inspector Colin Pitaway expressed his disbelief as to how it could take the most experienced legal brains in the country so long to make a decision on the fate of PC Brian Chester. He stated that they had filed an official complaint about this to the Police Complaints Commission as he felt that the delay was unfair on both the officer who shot the boy and the boy's family. After the killing, Ladywood MP Claire Short called for a public inquiry, stating that just over two years ago, police raided a house in similar circumstances in Winston Green in 1982, where a shot was fired at the bed of a sleeping child in a police house raid, just missing the girl by inches. And after a public protest of that incident, police had promised it would never happen again. She stated, it's unforgivable that it has happened twice. The incident MP Claire Short was talking about was an incident that happened in 1982 at a home in Winston Green, Birmingham on Merry Hill Drive. At the home of James Hazel and his wife Beverly Hazel, a police raid was conducted where again, police claimed that they had accidentally fired a shot into the headboard of two-year-old Abina Hazel, who was asleep in her bed next to her eight-year-old brother, Stephen Hazel. Luckily, neither child was injured, but they were said to have been left very frightened by the incident. An official complaint was lodged and police took away the bullet-riddled bed and replaced it with a new one. The family made a claim for damages and an internal inquiry was held about the bungled raid. In regards to the John Shorthouse killing, Shadow Home Office Minister Alf Dobbs called for an independent inquiry stating that there had been too many incidents in which police had been trigger happy. Whilst another Shadow Home Office Minister, Clive Solly, urged for an urgent overhaul of police guidelines and training on firearms. PC Brian Chester the policeman that had shot five-year-old John was said to be very distressed by what had happened and was being seen by a doctor with counsellor George Law expressing his horror of the killing but stating that he felt sorry for PC Chester as he must be feeling terrible. Colleagues of PC Chester stated that he was going through a living nightmare and was taking tranquilizers, and PC Chester was also seeing a top Harley psychologist all paid for by a police federation to help him get over the shock. The chair of the police federation said that PC Brian Chester was literally worried sick and that the PC was going through a hell of a time, far worse than anyone could possibly realise. He has to be given some help because of the enormous tragedy and that the PC was suffering from post-shooting trauma. Another senior officer said no one seems to realise just what the officer that pulled the trigger is going through. He's not a callous man. We are talking about the father of three small children who worships his family. He just can't believe what has happened and is going through a nightmare. His nerves are in pieces and is facing a nervous breakdown. And with doctors fearing for his mental health, PC Brian Chester was ruled out from having to speak publicly about the incident or from appearing at any press conferences 
as they deemed that it would be injurious to his mental well-being to have to face any kind of public questioning. Meanwhile, through her grief, Jacqueline Shorthouse, the five-year-old shop boy's mother, was the one who had to identify his body. She said her other son, Dennis, had been waking up every night since the bungled raid that killed his brother with nightmares and screaming for his dad. Her son also kept on asking where his brother was, saying, When was John coming home? Mrs Shorthouse told her son that John had gone to Jesus. Mrs Shorthouse also stated that she was concerned about the long-term effects the shooting would have on four-year-old Danny Shorthouse, as Danny was old enough to understand what had happened. She stated that she would not bring her son up to hate the police. He will make his own mind up, but she stated that the police knew John was married and how many children he had. They could have arrested him when he was walking down the street. My children didn't do any harm, and nor have I. They should have seen that he had children there. Unable to return back to the home where her son was shot dead, Jacqueline was staying with friends. Neighbours of the Shorthouse family were in tears when news of the tragedy was broken to them. With one neighbour, Mrs Janet Toms, a close friend of the family, saying that she had to explain the death to her son Wesley, who was John's best mate. She said, I can hardly believe it has happened. Just the other day, John was round here playing. He and Wesley were best mates and were always scrapping and playing with their cars. John was a great kid. It's just tragic. Another neighbour, Mrs Catherine Hetherington, burst into tears, stating, How on earth do we teach the kids here to respect law and order now this dreadful thing has happened? He was only a little tot. The community banded together to start a collection fund to help towards the funeral of little John Shorthouse. Over 700 was raised by customers from 11 pubs in Kings Norton and Spark Hill. And neighbours presented a 615 signature petition calling for a public inquiry, with supporters saying they don't want a whitewash. After the botched house raid, the next day, with approval from high-ranking senior officers, it was agreed that Jacqueline could meet her husband John and special arrangements were made for them to meet in a secure accommodation and not a prison cell on the insistence of MP Mr Tony Beaumont Dark. A constant calling by relatives, MPs and supporters to police for a public inquiry and to make the findings of the police's investigations public, answering questions such as How many officers carrying out the raid was armed? Was there any danger of an attack on police in the flat at the time of the gunshot? In what circumstances was the shot fired? Was it shot knowingly or subconsciously? Was it an accident or was it negligence? Was the weapon issued appropriate to the assignment? Was there prior knowledge of children living in the home? Are the officers chosen sufficiently well screened to ensure that they are temperamentally suitable for the job? Tory MP Mr Anthony Beaumont Dark, Selio constituency said, I have never known a police inquiry that has tried to hush things up. He said that he would demand to see the report of the police inquiry into the shooting and that a lawyer representing the family ought to be allowed to attend the inquiry and question witnesses. He said that if the reports can't be made public, then he should have the right at least to see it to allay any public fears. In the second breath, MP Beaumont Dark also said that he did not think it was necessary for the investigation to be held in public because the police were usually harsher on their own people. Despite a public cry for an independent public inquiry, only an internal inquiry done by the police's internal investigators, with only a summary of the internal inquiry being made publicly available, and not the full report. 
However, an inquest was held. The difference between an inquiry and an inquest is that an inquiry is conducted by a UK judge that has been appointed by the government. The aims of the inquiry are set out by the government where questions and concerns of all parties, whether public or organisations, are all taken into account. An inquiry inquires a full, open, fair and thorough investigation by an independent body. Inquiries involve looking at more broader range of evidence, so it is common for proceedings to take longer, sometimes stretching over several years. Public inquiries have the power to decide blame and lawyers can ask questions to witnesses. An inquest, on the other hand, is an investigation carried out by a coroner in order to establish who the deceased was, when and where they died, and the reason why they died. In most inquests, it will only be the reason why an individual has died that needs to be uncovered. An inquest establishes the cause of death. For example, if it was an accident or unlawful killing, but an inquest cannot decide who is to blame. The scope of most inquests are limited. An inquest for John Shorthouse Jr. was opened on the 29th of August 1985, just five days after his killing, by Deputy City Coroner Mr Christopher Ball. The inquest lasted just 10 minutes, where the slain boy's mother broke down in tears and the proceedings were halted while she sipped water. A summary of what happened was given by Detective Chief Superintendent Colin Moore. Jacqueline Shorthouse was asked a series of questions, after which point the coroner adjourned the inquest, saying that John Jr.'s body would be held by police until their inquiries were complete and his body released as soon as possible. On October the 4th, 1985, five-year-old John Shorthouse Jr., was buried at Christ Church, Yardley Wood. His father, John Shorthouse Sr., was brought to the service from Swansea Jail by police escort, shackled in handcuffs to a police officer whilst holding his wife Jacqueline's hand, and he broke down in tears, with his wife also sobbing uncontrollably as his tiny coffin was lowered into the ground. The service was conducted by the vicar, Reverend Richard Postill, who had married the couple in the same church just six years earlier. The coffin had a wreath of white and yellow chrysanthemums in the shape of a BMX bike, and crowds lined the streets of the church. A wreath presented at the graveside was from Chief Constable Mr Geoffrey Deere on behalf of all the officers at West Midlands Police. Another wreath was presented from Assistant Chief Constable of Lancashire, Mr. Joel Mounsey, who was in charge of the inquiry into the boys' deaths, and a wreath was also sent by the Police Complaints Authority. The funeral cortege was followed by a group of motorcycle riders from the Nomad Cycle Tramp Club. John Shorthouse Senior's trial started on January the 27th, 1986, where he pleaded guilty at Swansea Crown Court to armed robbery and possession of a firearm. Details of the crime came out at the trial. John Shorthouse Sr., Stephen Herbert and Jonathan Williams drove a Ford Capri from Birmingham to Kidwelly, Wales, expecting rich pickings from the old malt restaurant they were planning on robbing. They went into the restaurant when the last customers had left. They tied up and gagged restaurant owner Norman Aubrey, who was an ex-RAF squadron leader, and terrorised him with a sawn-off shotgun by threatening him with death. A shotgun was levelled at his head, and Mr Aubrey said he heard a gun cartridge being loaded, and he was questioned about cash in the restaurant and where the safe was. The gun was then pressed against his neck, and he was forced upstairs to a bedroom, and his hands tied to a beam. What the robbers didn't know is that the week's takings had already been taken to the bank the day before, so all that was left on the premises was £180 in the till from the day's takings, which they took, 
as well as two cheques that were worthless. When customers started knocking on the door downstairs, the robbers fled. The restaurant owner told police that the robbers had a West Midlands accent and going off of a tip-off, the raid happened two days later when Mr. Shorthouse was also found to be growing cannabis. Stephen Herbert also pleaded guilty to armed robbery, but third man Jonathan Williams denied the charges. On Thursday the 30th of January 1986, John Shorthouse Sr. was found guilty of all charges and sentenced to five years. Mr. Justice Tudor Price told Mr. Shorthouse that he would have been given nine years but because he pleaded guilty, he had given him five. He also said that he had also lessened his sentence because of what had happened to his five-year-old son in the aftermath, saying that he is never going to be able to forgive himself for his son's death. The judge said, It is quite clear from social inquiry reports that you have suffered. Stephen Herbert also pleaded guilty and was sentenced to four years in prison while Jonathan Williams, who had pleaded not guilty, was given 10 years. At Birmingham Crown Court, on September the 11th, 1986, 48-year-old Walter Betts, a former boxer of Janice Grove, Yardley, pleaded guilty to assaulting the police officer, Tracy Hughes, who had been the officer dragged out of her police car and beaten up by a mob on the day of John Shorthouse Jr.'s killing. Walter Bett said that he had only headbutted the officer, Tracy Hughes, after she grabbed his labels and yelled, You're nicked, as he walked past the disturbance. The prosecution said he also punched her, which he denied. The judge, Malcolm Potter, questioned why the force used women officers in mob situations, with Inspector David Patterson telling him, A shortage of officers meant that women police have to take potluck with their male colleagues and deal with whatever situation arises. After being headbutted, PC Tracy Hughes was knocked unconscious but later got up to arrest 17 stone Walter Betts. Walter Bett was jailed for nine months with the judge saying, you made a gratuitous attack on a policewoman, you must go to jail. On Wednesday, January the 8th, 1986, it was decided by the Director of Public Prosecutions that PC Brian Chester, who had shot five-year-old John Shorthouse Jr., would be prosecuted and tried for manslaughter. A summons was served on the PC to appear in court on Tuesday, February the 25th, 1986, and he was given unconditional bail and legal aid. PC Brian Chester's wife, Verena Chester spoke out in an interview in a daily newspaper saying that news of the boy's death was quite a shock as her husband hadn't mentioned anything about it that day and that a few days after the shooting whilst heavily pregnant with their third child she, her husband and their two children five-year-old Martin and three-year-old Rachel had to move into a guest house in Wales where they stayed for 10 days until Verena insisted that she wanted to go back home. The couple had been married for eight years by then. Verena said that she had been under a great strain but had managed to cope with it and that it was very hard at first but easier now. Verena spoke about how sympathetic people had been and that they had received lots of letters of support from well-wishers all over the country. She said that her worst time was when she gave birth which was a boy who they named Stuart because at first she didn't feel as though she should have him. She said that when her son was born, she was pleased but upset because the little boy had died. But she had her son and went on to say that she knows how she would feel if anything happened to their five-year-old son Martin and that she's just very sorry. She spoke about her worry for her husband, saying that he doesn't talk to her about the incident and how he was severely depressed and deeply upset and being treated for shock by a Harley specialist. She also went on to say how their marriage was strong and they'd always got on well together and been close. She then went on to describe what her husband had been up to 
at home while suspended on full pay. Saying that they'd both taken up keep fit classes in Coventry and how her husband was busy making DIY improvements on their new home. Verena said she would stand by her husband no matter what happens. The trial began in July 1986 at Stafford Crown Court with the police officer saying that he could not look at his own five-year-old son after the murder. He claimed his gun went off accidentally and claimed that the boy's wiggle and the groan that he had heard had happened simultaneously after the boy had been shot. He claims that upon lifting the blankies, he saw a hole in the boy's t-shirt. The officer stood in the dock, wiping away tears and sipped water as he answered questions. He claimed that the worst thing was that he was responsible for the child's death, but he didn't know why, saying that as far as he was concerned, he did everything right, but obviously something happened. He claimed that he did not do anything that went against his training. But the firearms expert, Mr. Thomas Warlow, a home office forensic scientist that took the stand under oath, told the court that in normal conditions of handling a service gun, it was most unlikely the gun could ever be fired accidentally. And so that was why the makers of the gun had felt it unnecessary to fit a safety catch. Then in the second breath, the same firearms expert agreed that despite all the police training, the human element could not be eliminated and an officer could fire a gun accidentally. The prosecutor, Mr Fennell, said that PC Chester had been charged with manslaughter because the manner in which he'd caused the child's death was grossly negligent or reckless and that PC was acting contrary to all his training and instructions. Mr Fennell explained that this was because the PC had fired his gun when in no danger and without warning and that the PC's explanation that he did not see the child and only a bundle of blankets could not be true as according to scientific evidence, none of the blankets were damaged in any way. So the only thing between the end of the muzzle and the child's flesh was his t-shirt. But the PC stuck to his claims, saying that he did not realise that his gun had gone off until he heard a moan from under the blankets, and that upon lifting the blankets he saw blood. It was then that he realised his gun had gone off. Jacqueline Shorthouse took the stand and said that she woke to four officers circling her bed. Her husband was taken away. Then a policewoman had come to her saying, I've got bad news for you. Your little boy has been shot in the leg, despite it being his chest at a distance of within nine inches. The court was told that upon shooting the little boy, PC Chester panicked, repeatedly saying, I shot him. I shot him and then tried to stem the bleeding with a nappy. The court was told by the prosecution that the shot was from a 30 degree downward angle pointing down onto the bed so the PC must have been above the child when he shot him. The prosecution also said that it must have been obvious to anyone going into the second bedroom that it was a child's room because of the presence of a cot and a large teddy bear. Two other officers claimed to have also heard the firing of the gun. On the fourth day of the trial, PC Brian Chester was found not guilty of the manslaughter of five-year-old John Shorthouse. Jacqueline Shorthouse, the mother of the slain child, stated that she felt upset and bitter and that she did not feel that justice had been done at all. After his acquittal, PC Brian Chester said in a statement, All involved in this tragedy can never be the same again. I am sure Miss Shorthouse will never forgive, and I will never forget. A crowd of 400 supporters clapped and cheered as the PC left the court. Eleven days later, on the 15th of July 1986, PC Brian Chester was back at work, working on the police force again, claiming 
I've been to hell and back trying to cope with the situation, but you just have to cope with it. It has been a terrible ordeal from the beginning, but fortunately, I have the support of my family and colleagues. I feel very deeply for the Shorthouse family. I have sympathy with Mrs Shorthouse and her views. I am sorry she cannot accept it was an accident. PC Chester was welcomed back by his community with banners and bunting. And six months later, in January 1987, PC Brian Chester was promoted to sergeant. A few days after PC had been promoted to sergeant, John Shorthouse Sr. was found in his cell at Long Lawton Top Security Prison in Worcestershire with his wrist slashed and was taken to hospital under armed guard. Mr Shorthouse was said to be devastated over his son's death and angry that Brian Chester had been cleared of manslaughter. It was also said that his wife Jacqueline had asked for a divorce when she had visited him earlier that day at the prison. In August 1987, John Shorthouse Sr. was granted parole and was released from prison in October 1987, having served 19 months of a five-year sentence. He was said to be staying with friends. Jacqueline Shorthouse received just 3,500 compensation for the killing of her child. After backlash over this, an MP said that the council had not been mean and paltry as this was the amount that under law was the maximum amount that could be paid out for bereavements of this type. Whilst Mr John Vaughan, the solicitor in charge of civil litigation for the West Midlands, stated that if we were the Scrooges we've been described as, we would have given nothing at all, but we paid up to help the family and we paid for the funeral. After a lot of backlash from the media and public, as well as MPs, Three years later, in 1988, Jacqueline was awarded an extra £10,000 award payout from the West Midlands Police Authority, with 7500 going to herself and 2500 to be split between her two boys under the condition that the two boys could not take legal action against the police themselves when they reached 18. Now a sergeant, Brian Chester got on with his life, enjoying it with his sons, his wife and his daughter. But on September the 14th, 2016, Sergeant Brian Chester lost his only daughter, Rachel, at the tender age of 33. She passed away at Heartlands Hospital from a rare form of breast cancer leaving behind husband Rob and two young sons, Daniel and Matthew.